and I usually try to get a speaker of note to kick the class off uh, to generate interest. And uh, it's an honor to have Dan Lynn, who is the uh, executive director for Illinois uh, Normal, uh, speak about uh, cannabis. Anything, there'll be a Q&A afterwards. Uh, he drove all the way up to Springfield just to present to the class. So let's give him a warm welcome, and I'm going to turn this over. Well, thank you, Bruce, for having me, putting on this class, educating folks on this topic. It's very important stuff, and thank you all for being here and attending. Hopefully, it'll be worth your while. The talk I'll give is mostly on medical cannabis, but uh, once when I wrap up the slides, which are about 30, 35 slides, um, you know, if we did want to talk about recreational cannabis, where I see the future of cannabinoid medicine, uh, what politically needs to happen for things to really change in Illinois as well as well as this country, I'd be more than happy to talk about that. But at least for the duration of the, the bulk of this talk, it'll be really focused on medical cannabis, uh, the political world of Illinois, medical cannabis law, as well as what it took us to get this law here in Illinois. Um, and the, the topic here, I think, is, is really appropriate, the legal gray area of cannabis, because uh, you're, you're going to start to see a lot of lawyers look at this field now, and it's a really strange area when it comes to the law, because most of the time the law is real clear-cut and, and, you know, what is legally allowed, what is not legally allowed. And when it comes to medical cannabis, even if it's legally allowed in Illinois, it is still illegal federally. And I'll go into some more details about that. But that's kind of the overview of the talk is the legal gray area. Uh, this is who I am. I am the executive director of the Illinois chapter of Normal, which is the National Organization to Reform Marijuana Laws. I've had that title for, oh, about nine years. I've been volunteering with the organization since 2001. I have another title with this industry association. Uh, and my real motivation for getting involved with this group and with this topic stemmed from uh, high school class, college classes where I was doing pro-con debates about the legalization of cannabis and really started to look at the history of prohibition of cannabis uh, because it wasn't something that was really taught in our history classes. When I was in high school, our history class taught us about alcohol prohibition. I grew up on Fox Lake, which is north of here on the chain of lakes, and uh, just about every bar on the chain of lakes has some type of legend about being Al Capone's hideout when things got tough in the city. Uh, so we had this real connection of Al Capone and alcohol prohibition in the area that I grew up in. And then our history class would end. The next class we would go to was a, a health class, and they would talk to us about the dangers and evils of drugs and alcohol. And essentially that public, that health class equated all drugs as being equally bad and equally dangerous. And as a young 16-year-old, I knew people that were smoking cannabis. I knew people that were drinking. And I could see both in my friends the differences in those substances as well as how they made those people feel and act. Uh, people at that age that were drinking were getting into fights. They were vomiting all over themselves or all over the place. My friends that were smoking cannabis, they wanted to play video games. They were hanging out and laughing. Uh, there wasn't that same type of violence associated with that use. And I could really tell that I wasn't being given accurate information in those health classes. And then when I would be doing my pro-con debates or uh, persuasive essays on why cannabis should be legal, I was really starting to look at how did they make this plant illegal in the first place because there wasn't that type of foundation in the history class. And even uh, in the internet, which was somewhat new in the mid-90s, uh, you couldn't get a lot of good information about what it was that made this plant illegal in the land of the free and in America. So that was kind of how I started to get involved with Normal. Um, even to this day, some people are unsure of how I got that title. Uh, it's not because I smoke the most pot in Illinois. It's not because I can do the biggest bong hits in Illinois. Uh, it's really just because I've been actively working to end cannabis in Illinois uh, in this position for about as long as anybody that's been with that organization. When I first got involved, there were other people that had started the organization. Some of them moved on in life. Some of them got divorced and no longer wanted to participate in the organization. Some of them moved to California, and some of them died. Uh, and over time, I was the last man standing in the room, so the title kind of fell upon me. Uh, but that's really the genesis of how I became the executive director. Uh, but it's not that I have the, uh, the biggest lungs for consumption in the state of Illinois. Uh, so getting right into it, for those that don't know, uh, this will be real good information. For people that do know, this will be kind of review stuff. Cannabis is a Schedule I substance according to the federal law. What that means 
is that this substance has a high potential for abuse, it has no currently accepted medical use in the United States, and a lack of accepted safety. Uh, this is what it is required to be a Schedule I substance. And as I'll show you, the, the scheduling of cannabis as a Schedule I substance, it's about as inaccurate as you could ever find a scheduling of a substance. Um, it goes in direct uh, opposition to the science that's out there. It goes in direct opposition to the widespread use of this product, as well as the vast majority of people that consume it that do find some type of benefit or relief from it. Uh, but those three criteria are the ones that are supposed to be reserved for Schedule One substances. Other substances that are Schedule One, uh, you know, you look at LSD, heroin, peyote, ibogaine, DMT, psilocybin, MDMA. Um, who on here knows what ibogaine is? Anyone? Okay, excellent. That's good. I'm, I'm, I'm really impressed. A lot of people aren't aware of ibogaine. Uh, it's a substance that's going to start to be used to, to treat opioid addiction. Uh, it comes from a, a, an African root, um, and it's, it's something that is just starting to really be examined. Um, and the interesting thing and why I chose each of these <laughs> Schedule One substances, not because I think that they accurately fit Schedule One, uh, but because I think that each one of those you will start to see some type of medical use or more people looking at them under the lens of a medicine in the next five to ten years. Yet each of these are labeled as a Schedule One substance according to the federal government. Uh, and for what it's worth, the Controlled Substances Act of 1970 is where these substances came about being scheduled. Uh, you also start to see um, the similar, similar substances being uh, labeled as Schedule One substance under the, uh, I believe it's the Analog Controlled Substance Act. So if a, a substance is chemically very similar to those, it's also going to be in that same scheduling. Um, now, one of the hypocrisies of keeping cannabis as a Schedule One substance is that the federal government had this Compassionate Investigative, Investigational New Drug Program which was stopped taking applications in 1992. What this program did was allow patients across the United States of America to apply to the federal government to be involved in this investigational program to use medical cannabis. Uh, and even today, there are four surviving patients in this program. Each one of those patients gets 300 joints per month. Uh, it comes in a small uh, aluminum cookie tin. Uh, one of the patients is Irv Rosenfeld, who's from Florida. Um, and there's a plug for his book on there, which I haven't read it yet, but I would say it's a good one if you wanted to see a good background on that IND program. But the federal government grows this medicine at the University of Mississippi. Uh, they send these cookie tins full of joints to each of these patients once a month. Um, and the, it, it's a, uh, a, a way that the federal government is showing that they at least have accepted medical cannabis enough that they're actively growing it and sending it to these few remaining patients. And the reason that they stopped accepting those applications in 1992 wasn't because they didn't think it was an actual medicine. It wasn't because the scientific data proved that it wasn't a medicine. It was because due to the uh, AIDS epidemic of the 1980s and early 90s, they were being flooded with applications from people who wanted to get involved in this program. And in typical government bureaucratic fashion, instead of providing more funding to have more people process these applications to get these people either approved or denied in this program, they simply shut the program down. And these four remaining patients have been grandfathered in ever since the, uh, the late 80s and early 90s when the program started. Uh, and you can see uh, Irv Rosenfeld, he does a lot of work online. You can see these cookie tins that he has. Um, and like I said, his book is, uh, it's, it was just released last year, and I think it's a good uh, way for people to see what this program has done on the federal level. Uh, another example of how the scheduling of cannabis as a Schedule One substance is inaccurate uh, is through this patent, number 6630507 which is a patent for cannabinoids as an anti-inflammatory and neuroprotective uh, property or compound. The interesting thing with this is, uh, one, that it's a patent, which is used to protect proprietary information for businesses. Uh, the second thing is that the patent is actually held by the Department of Health and Human Services by the United States of America. And then the third thing is that the patent is actually on the process of isolating cannabinoids and not necessarily on the compounds themselves. Uh, 
a lot of times we've asked lawmakers, we've asked lawyers, uh, why can't we just point to this patent and say that this is a direct uh, example of the scheduling being inaccurate for cannabis and we can't get a straight answer uh, inquiries into the US Patent Office uh, they aren't really well received in terms of explaining what this patent means for the scheduling of cannabis or even when there are patients being prosecuted under federal law for cannabis uh, despite being in a state legal program uh, other cases, like I mentioned, with the federal law with cannabis being a Schedule One substance, the Gonzalez versus Rach is by far one of the uh, more cited cases. Uh, and essentially, what the Supreme Court ruled in Gonzalez versus Rach was that because cannabis is such a widely consumed product and such a, uh, a large percentage of the population uses cannabis, that it's actually, even if it's it allowed legally by the state of California where Angel Rach was from, uh, the Interstate Commerce Clause still applied because uh, the, the Supreme Court essentially said that there's just so many people consuming cannabis that even if this cannabis is being grown and meant for consumption only in California, there's gonna be enough of it leaking into other states that it's going to be uh, a trigger for them to jump in and, and regulate it under the Interstate Commerce Clause, which Congress and the Supreme Court uh, have held as part of their duties in the U.S. Constitution. Uh, the other three bullet points there are aspects of law that you're going to see become a bigger issue as you start to see more states legalize medical cannabis, as you start to see more states legalize recreational cannabis. I'm not sure if anybody's a lawyer in the room or plans to be a lawyer in the room, but if you did want to go into law, you could pretty much start an entire career on any of those three bullet points because they're going to be hot button issues in the next decade as you start to see the laws around cannabis loosen up but still have these kind of gray areas. Uh, when it comes to employee rights, uh, we've already seen this in Michigan where an employee for Walmart who was legally allowed to use cannabis in the state of Michigan was fired by Walmart for failing a drug test. Now most of the time if you are prescribed drugs and you have to take a drug test, if you show that you have those drugs in your system and you have a valid prescription for it, there's nothing that the employer can do. But because cannabis is illegal as a Schedule One substance federally, Walmart was still able to legally fire that person. Uh, that case, I don't know the exact name of it, it was about five years ago. I can tell you that the patient that was involved in that uh, died about two years ago from throat cancer. Um, <clears throat> And as my throat starts to get scratchy, I'm coming over a sinus infection, so uh, bear with me if I start to lose my voice a little bit here. When it comes to gun owner rights, and we saw a lot of this here in Illinois, because the ATF is a federal agency that regulates guns, and because cannabis, again, is illegal federally, even if a state law legally allows a patient to have medical cannabis, or even if a state like Colorado has a legal recreational law, there's gonna be conflicts between uh, person who has a gun who legally is allowed to have a gun but is also legally allowed to consume cannabis either for recreational purposes or medical purposes uh, the, the ATF could come in and either confiscate their guns or could come in and prosecute them for the cannabis and even when in Illinois if you were to fill out a FOID card application or when you go to buy a gun in Illinois uh, one of the questions that they will ask you is are you addicted to any drugs or illegal substances and they specifically call out cannabis as one of those substances uh, I'm not exactly sure why they use the, you know, specifically cannabis and not cocaine or methamphetamine, but that's one of those areas that you'll start to see uh, more conflict and more legal cases developing when it comes to both owning a firearm in Illinois or anywhere in the U.S., as well as legally consuming cannabis for either medicinal or recreational purposes. And then parental rights, we've seen this in uh, states like Oregon and Washington. There have been a few cases in Illinois that I've heard about, um, not directly tied with the medical law in Illinois yet, but where parents will have their children taken away from them by an agency like DCFS or a, a Child and Family Protective Services for parents that consume cannabis uh, for recreational or for medical purposes. Uh, and if you, you look at what that really means is that even if a parent is responsibly taking care of their child, responsibly consuming medical cannabis or recreational cannabis, there still is that possibility that their children or child could be taken away from them simply because of the way that the federal law looks at cannabis differently than how the state law looks. And I don't think anybody would advocate that taking away that child is gonna do that child any good, assuming that their parent is responsibly consuming that substance and not being negligent in their parental rights. 
Uh, but that's something that I think you're going to see a lot more law practices start to focus on when it comes to more states going recreational with cannabis or more states with medical cannabis is uh, protecting parental rights in their children so that children aren't being taken away from these families just simply because the parent is using cannabis for medical purposes or recreational purposes. All right, now getting into the Illinois law, uh, it was titled the Compassionate Use of Medical Cannabis Pilot Program Act. The pilot word in there I can directly take responsibility for. Part of the political process in Illinois was making this something that would be tolerable. Uh, and one of the ways that Illinois lawmakers like to make things a little bit more stomachable is that they make it a pilot, which includes a specific sunset date, which means that the law will expire at a specific time. Most of the time they put that in there just to pass the law. And as you get closer to that expiration date, they'll automatically revoke that expiration date and the program becomes permanent. I do expect that to happen with this one, but at least with the way that this law was designed, uh, it is only going to be a four-year uh, pilot program. It was signed into law by Governor Pat Quinn on August 1st. It took effect January 1st. Today is June 9th, 2015, and medical cannabis is still not available to patients in Illinois. Um, why is that important? Well, because this is a medicine. This is something that is helpful to a lot of people. And I can tell you that there was a patient, his name is Daniel Davis, who was at the bill signing. He got his picture taken with Governor Pat Quinn. He's the reason, along with one other, other individual in Illinois, that the condition residual limb pain or phantom limb pain was added. Um, does anyone know what that condition is? Residual limb pain, phantom limb pain? Essentially, it's when you have an amputation and you still get pain from what used to be your limb. So if you have your arm or your leg amputated for whatever reason, you still can feel pain in that phantom limb. Daniel Davis had uh, one of his legs amputated as a result of diabetes, and he was uh, one of two patients who had that condition that was actively lobbying the Illinois legislature to get it added. The other patient was the spouse of a state representative, so uh, we were able to get that condition added at the last minute. Uh, Daniel Davis was at the bill signing on August 1st. Uh, he passed away, uh, I want to say April of 2014. Um, and, and why I bring that up is because when we're dealing with medicine, when we're dealing with people's lives here, this is something that we want to get into their hands and have them available for them as soon as possible so that we can provide that type of relief. Uh, as we start to get closer to that four-year deadline of this program uh, expiring and patients still don't have medicine, you can start to uh, feel the frustration that the patients have of this law was passed to try and give them relief, but the bureaucracy has tied it up. The delays in the program have prevented them from gaining access to this medicine. Even today, if patients are approved to use medical cannabis in Illinois, but it's not legally available, they still could be subject to arrest even if they have medicine on them but have been approved in the state. Um, and for what it's worth, it was a 10-year legislative process to get medical cannabis legalized in Illinois. When I first got involved in the early 2000s, the sponsor of the medical cannabis was a state representative, Larry McKeon. And State Representative Larry McKeon was a gay man with AIDS that would get up and testify in committees about how his lover had died from wasting syndrome, and this was the only thing that helped him. And in the early 2000s, there was still that stigma of people that were gay and people that had AIDS. And his colleagues in the Department of, or on the Committee of Healthcare Availability and Access in the Illinois House, uh, they wouldn't even vote that bill out of committee in those years. And I used to go to those committee hearings as a, a young activist with uh, idealism in my mind and eyes about, you know, why should people be prevented from using this plant if it gives them relief. And I would sit there and hear Larry McKeon pour his heart out on those committee hearings and, and testifying, you know, breaking down and crying and going through that emotional trauma of having to watch his lover die. And then his testimony would end. The former head of the DEA, Peter Bensinger, would get up there and make a few real flippant remarks about how medical cannabis is no different than medical crack cocaine, no medicine is smoked, and then he would just get up and walk out of the room before the vote would even take place. And the votes obviously weren't able to get the bill out of committee in those years, uh, but that was the real opposition in the early 2000s to medical cannabis in Illinois. And over that 10-year process, obviously, we were able to move the legislation through that uh, committee and, and through the legislative process of how a bill becomes a law. Uh, but to kind of give you some oversight, uh, State Representative Larry McKeon, he died himself of complications of AIDS about five years ago, actually getting closer to six this summer. 
Uh, so that just kind of shows you the length of the, the political process to get this substance available for patients in Illinois. And even after the political process is over, we're still in the middle of this bureaucratic process to get this medicine to the people that need it. Uh, and, and like I said, the medicine still isn't available. It probably won't be until the end of this calendar year. Now to get into the specifics of the Illinois law, uh, and that top line is really just about as uh, boiled down what does this law do for people in Illinois. It allows for doctors to recommend cannabis for a specific list of qualifying conditions. Uh, that top bullet point, no, recipro no reciprocity, is important because the lawmakers in Illinois, they were looking at states like California, they were looking at states like Colorado, Michigan, where doctors would be writing patients recommendations for medical cannabis if the patient simply paid them a $50 fee. Uh, the lawmakers in Illinois would point to some of the 60 minute specials that were done on some of the, excuse me, dispensaries on Venice Beach, where the doctors would just take your $50, come up with a condition for you if you couldn't think of one on your own, and then give you that card for medical cannabis in California. The lawmakers in Illinois would not tolerate that. They thought that that was a farce. They wanted to make the law in Illinois be much more restrictive and much more toned for people who they felt truly needed medical cannabis. Uh, and part of that reason for the no reciprocity is that uh, because Illinois has a specific list of qualifying conditions and other requirements, they didn't want people to simply fly out to California, get the medical cannabis cards in California, and then come back to Illinois and be able to legally purchase and consume medical cannabis. Part of that restrictive nature of this program is that patient-doctor relationship. And this is extremely vague. And even if you are a lawyer or talk to a lawyer, what is a bona fide patient-doctor relationship? There isn't a real specific part of the law that you could point to and say, well, the patient has been going to this doctor for five years, or the patient has been seeing this doctor for 30 days. There isn't a specific requirement on both the length of the doctor treating the patient, nor in the amount of visits that the patient has had with the doctor. And part of the reason that the state of Illinois kept this vague was that they knew that doctors move away, doctors die, patients switch doctors. They didn't want to put some type of arbitrary number like six months or three visits, um, which would require the patient to see the doctor in order for them to have that bona fide relationship. All they were looking to do was to prevent the type of doctor shopping or medical cannabis clinics from opening in Illinois. And uh, I'll talk a little bit later about how even with that type of language in the law, we still do have medical cannabis clinics in Illinois, but they are increasingly under investigation and heat from the Department of Financial and Professional Regulations, which is the agency that oversees doctors in the state of Illinois. And one of the other things that's uh, that third bullet point is that doctors can't have a financial interest in any of the medical cannabis dispensaries or cultivation centers in Illinois if they're going to be writing a recommendation. Now the doctor can have that financial interest, they just won't be able to write the recommendations then. And this is actually a big hang up for the program in Illinois because if doctors don't really have that type of financial interest to write these recommendations like they do in other states or like they do with other drugs and, and pharmaceutical drugs, um, we've, we just don't see the doctors writing the recommendations in Illinois. And that is the number one complaint that I hear on a regular basis from the patients in Illinois that have the qualifying conditions is that they can't get their doctor to write the recommendation for them. And one of the things that we've also heard from patients in Illinois is that a lot of the larger medical groups or hospitals in Illinois have top-down directives ordering the doctors not to write these recommendations because it could jeopardize the hospital's ability to be in possession of controlled substances from their DEA license. Um, now even though those Doctors have a First Amendment right to have those discussions with the patients. We haven't been able to get any of them to forward us an email or any type of paper trail about those directives or orders because the press would have a field day with it. I have reporters that are constantly asking me if, if I can find them and dig that those type of directives up, and I haven't been able to get any of that proof, but that's what the patients are telling us from the doctors. And just about every doctor, or not every doctor, but the vast majority of them are affiliated with some type of medical group or larger hospital system in the state of Illinois. I live in Springfield. There's three major hospitals in Springfield, and each one of them have a directive not to have their doctors writing these recommendations, but yet we still can't find that paper trail to bring to the media and help try and alleviate the situation for these patients. So the Illinois law does allow for more conditions to be added. There's two mechanisms for doing that. One is through legislative approval. We saw this last year with epilepsy, 
as well as people uh, that are under the age of 18 or minors that have these qualifying conditions. The original law didn't allow minors to be involved in the program. Uh, that was something that was put in there just strictly for political reasons to get the legislation through. And one of the highlights of my career as an activist was after that 10 year process of battling it out with people like the former head of the DEA and the law enforcement community about medical cannabis. When it came last year to adding this um, uh, seizure disorders and epilepsy bill for children as well as for adults. We had a committee hearing with about two dozen families of children with epilepsy, all in purple shirts, with some of their children with epilepsy in the room, and not one person from the opposition got up to testify against adding these conditions. This was right after the Dr. Sanjay Gupta special came out talking about Charlotte's Web and the cannabis oil that's high in CBD helping reduce the seizures. And even in that committee hearing, one of the children with epilepsy actually had a seizure in the middle of the hearing. But that was a, uh, a night and day difference in terms of both the tone of the committee as well as the opposition to medical cannabis in Illinois because for years we have the law enforcement community getting up there and railing about medical cannabis, about how this is going to be detrimental to our families, how this is going to end up on the playgrounds, how this isn't going to work out well for public safety. And then all of a sudden when you were talking about allowing parents to be able to provide medical cannabis to their children, the opposition was nowhere to be found. There were some provisions put in there so that children would not be allowed to smoke medical cannabis, they'd have to take edibles or oils, uh, but all of those are very reasonable restrictions I feel when it comes to medical cannabis. One of the mothers that testified in that committee hearing uh, didn't really talk so much about how medical cannabis was helping her child, but just how much of a struggle it was for her to live in Illinois and, and keep the health insurance for her family while her husband and child were in Colorado working with an experimental new type of medical cannabis that was high in CBD oil and what that type of uh, split in her family geographically was doing to her family and her relationship with her children. And this year we saw uh, PTSD uh, go through the legislative process to be added. Uh, the other mechanism for adding conditions is to petition this Medical Cannabis Advisory Board. Um, we also saw PTSD go through that advisory board. The problem with the advisory board is that even if the advisory board approves adding those conditions, the director of the Department of Public Health, who is an appointee of the governor, still can veto the addition of those conditions. So essentially, if the governor doesn't want to see these conditions added, he can order the director not to approve them. And that's where you can see these conditions go through the Medical Cannabis Advisory Board, but yet still not be added because the director doesn't allow them to be added um, <clears throat> through probably the, the wishes of the governor himself. Now, if you are a patient or potentially want to be a patient, this is a good website, both because it has all the online information, uh, but this PDF here is a 10 tips for going about the approval process. Um, the first one is talking to your doctor. Um, the second one is going and getting fingerprinted. Uh, that is one of the requirements in Illinois. I did an interview earlier today where the reporter was asking if I know of any other medical cannabis state that requires patients to be fingerprinted, and I don't think that that's a requirement in any other state. Uh, and part of the reason that the lawmakers put that in there is because there was this fear that Patients would be buying medical cannabis and turning around and selling it to whoever wanted to buy it from them. Uh, there's also a provision in the law that uh, <clears throat> disqualifies anybody with a felony drug conviction from participating in the program. So not only are we denying medicine to people that are felons, but we're requiring all patients to go and get fingerprinted. And that's unfortunate because for years we talked about how these patients are not supposed to be considered criminals for using this medicine that's providing them relief, yet now we're just treating them as a lighter form of a criminal by requiring them to go and get fingerprinted and then doing a background check on them. And if they do have a felony, they're disqualified from the program. One of the silver linings to this, um, and I haven't seen anything official from it, is that I've heard from patients who originally applied and got a disqualification letter because of a felony that was in their past, and there is no timeline on this, so even if you got convicted of a felony 20 or 30 years ago, you still wouldn't be allowed to participate. Some of those patients that got those disqualification letters have subsequently gotten letters saying that they have been reconsidered and then even more recently approved to be in this program. Uh, as of right now, there are 2,500 patients that have been approved to be in this program, um, which is an extremely low number. 
uh, when we were working on this legislation, we estimated that there would be somewhere between 10 and 15,000, given the restrictive nature of it, given the limited qualifying conditions, as well as the uh, fees and other hoops that the patients would have to jump through to participate. Because unlike other medicines, patients have to get fingerprinted, they have to go through a background check, and they also need to pay the state of Illinois a $100 annual fee. And this is something that we've been discussing lately as well, is that if patients already have access to medical cannabis that they can buy from their local dealer or from their local grandchild that is in high school, uh, what is it really worth it for them to go to a dispensary that still doesn't have medicine to buy this product legally when they have to pay that $100 fee, it costs about $65 to get your fingerprints, and you still have to have certain uh, uh, stigmas like with your uh, driver's license in Illinois, medical cannabis patients will have a, uh, uh, in the Secretary of State's database, it'll tell law enforcement that this person that's a medical cannabis patient, uh, if they pull them over and they're driving. So if you're a medical cannabis patient and a uh, local law enforcement officer pulls you over and they run your driver's license, that law enforcement officer will be informed that you're a medical cannabis patient. Uh, that goes directly against privacy laws, uh, but it's one of those things where that law enforcement officer needs to be able to verify that you legally are allowed to be in possession of this medicine. Nevertheless, it's just one more hiccup that patients need to deal with. It's just one more bureaucratic agency that was involved in the rulemaking process for this program, and it's one more way that we're treating medical cannabis patients different than we're treating any other patient in Illinois for using uh, what would be a prescription drug. So more specifics on the Illinois law, and again, this might be review for people that have been paying attention, but if not, uh, I'll try and go through this pretty quickly. It allows for 22 cultivation centers. Uh, those cultivation centers are the only places that will be allowed to grow medical cannabis in Illinois. They're broken down by one per state police district. Uh, in all practical purposes, though, there's only going to be 21 cultivation centers because one of the state police districts only covers the tollways, and there's nowhere that they could really open up a cultivation center other than the Des Plaines Oasis, which is vacant, but nobody decided to apply for that one. Uh, so you're going to see 21 cultivation centers. All those licenses have been issued, and those cultivation centers are in various stages of constructing uh, those buildings right now because it needs to be grown indoors only. And again, the Illinois law does not allow for any type of home cultivation for patients or caregivers. That's different than other states like Michigan or California or Colorado where patients or their caregiver could grow medical cannabis. And one of the things that we can look at other states and learn is that in a state that allows for home cultivation for patients or caregivers, the price of the medicine is held in check a little bit more than in a place where you have licensed growers selling to licensed retailers and then they're allowed to charge whatever they want because if the patients or caregivers can grow, uh, they'll be able to provide that medicine for themselves, whereas if they have to buy it from one of these legal outlets, they can charge whatever they will, and they're going to know that some of these patients are going to continue to buy it. It also allows for patients to um, better provide for different strains or know that the cannabis is grown organically, whereas when it's grown by these cultivation centers, they don't have that same type of ease of determining what strains are good for them and which ones they prefer, as well as the actual cultivation process itself. Some patients don't like to have medical cannabis grown hydroponically because of the carbon footprint that it leaves, uh, and that's something that's just not going to be able to be adjusted in this program as readily as if it was uh, a state that allowed for home cultivation or patient cultivation or caregiver cultivation. So these are the state police districts for anybody that's not familiar with them. Uh, DuPage County is part of District 2 and I believe there was five applications for cultivation centers in District 2 but only one of those licenses was awarded. So the cultivation centers, again, they have to grow in an enclosed lock facilities. They can only sell to dispensaries. Some of these slides were taken from a previous presentation, so I'll just try and go through them quickly, but they will have a little bit more graphics for people. Hopefully nobody's fallen asleep yet. Uh, they do require 24-hour security. Uh, the Illinois State Police District uh, that they're in is going to be able to look in on those cameras in real time and make sure that this medicine isn't being sold out the back door. Uh, that was one of those things that we put into the actual law itself because it gave us a little bit of a buy-in from the state police district if they knew that there was going to be only one cultivation center in their jurisdiction that they had to oversee. Um, the thought of them having to oversee three or four was something that a lot of them didn't want to deal with. And the reason it's with the state police is that in 2009, when we actually got a medical 
medical cannabis bill through the Senate but not through the House, uh, we were able to get the Illinois State Police to go neutral on the legislation because the governor was expecting the legislation to end up on his desk and the current governor at the time, Pat Quinn, didn't want to sign a medical cannabis bill when his own law enforcement agency, the state police, were actively opposing it because the state police are in the executive branch in the state of Illinois. Uh, the cultivation centers, they can have patients and caregivers as agents. Um, owners and partners and board members. That has been changed now that they cannot be agents, owners or partners, but they can still work at a cultivation center. And then all of the cultivation centers must submit the products for independent lab testing to make sure that they don't have any mold, residual pesticides, as well as for a cannabinoid profile. And the cultivation centers can only sell medicine to a dispensary in Illinois. Dispensaries in Illinois can only buy medicine from the cultivation centers in Illinois. They are subject to random inspections by the Department of Agriculture as well as the Department of Public Health. The reason that they're going to be inspected by the Department of Public Health is that unlike other states that allow for medical cannabis infused products to be a separate business or a separate licensing, the law in Illinois only allows for cultivation centers to be the ones making these infused products. So the medical cannabis brownies, cookies, tinctures, salves, ointments, uh, lotions, patches, all of those are going to have to be produced at the cultivation center level and because these cultivation centers then will have to have a uh, an inspected kitchen from producing these products, the Department of Public Health will go in and make sure that these kitchens are sanitary and, and using standard protocol for keeping them that way. Uh, and again, they can o they, they're the only ones that will be allowed to make infused products. This is something that I get a lot of phone calls about as well because somebody will call me and say they want to open up a business selling medical cannabis cookies, but their only way that they're going to be able to do that is if they sell their recipe to one of these cultivation centers or they get a job at one of these cultivation centers. Now, when it came to who was allowed to apply to be in the cultivation center or own a cultivation center, it was a $25,000 non-refundable fee. The first year license was a $200,000 fee. Every year is subsequent, it's a $100,000 licensing fee. Liquid assets, you needed to have $500,000, and that's liquid assets, that's not uh, your house or other uh, equity type assets. And then you need to have a $2 million escrow or surety bond, and then they'll give you $500,000 each year of that back. Um, what this all means is that you needed to have a lot of money if you wanted to be one of the licensed cultivation centers in Illinois. Uh, you couldn't be uh, the, the local frat boy that's got 25 plants and two lights in his basement growing. Uh, the real honest truth is that the only people that got these licenses in Illinois were people that came from uh, the investment world, the, the highly capitalized world, or they were already involved in the medical cannabis in, uh, in other states. Uh, very few people that were uh, either activists or people that were supporting medical cannabis in Illinois before it was a law were awarded these licenses. Uh, for instance, I, had a cons I have a consulting company. One of our clients that went after one of these cultivation center licenses uh, were some farm boys from a rural county in Illinois that are very familiar with growing corn and soy every year. They were able to come up with these fiscal requirements, but because they didn't have any experience growing medical cannabis, uh, they weren't awarded one of these licenses. And part of the application process actually gave bonus points to Illinois-based residents, but you needed to qualify for those bonus points, whereas anybody that was growing medical cannabis in another state, they were able to score higher on the experience points that weren't qualified, and then they wouldn't need the, the, uh, the local bonus points of being an Illinois resident. So the dispensaries, there's 60 of them. How they came up with this number is even more interesting than the state police. For a number of years, we allowed for 59 dispensaries in the legislation. It was going to be one for each state senate district. And then somebody who had a little bit of uh, wise foresight realized it doesn't look so good given the political corruption notoriety that Illinois has to tie a business license to a political uh, district or a legislative district. So they went from 59 state senate districts and 59 dispensaries to just 60 dispensaries distributed by population in the state of Illinois. Uh, that is where that number comes from. And again, it's a completely arbitrary number. Uh, it was just simply that before it was 59, one for each state senate district, and then they decided not to tie it to the state senate districts and increase the number by one. And they are distributed by population density. So for instance, in the city of Chicago, there are 13 dispensary licenses. Uh, and then outside of Chicago, but in Cook County, there's 11. If you go into the suburbs, there's uh, an, uh, another breakdown as well as for downstate. 
Um, and then one of the other aspects of this program is that patients have to designate a specific dispensary. Uh, and again, this is significantly different than how we look at other medicine, where if you have a prescription for Oxycontin, you can get that prescription filled at either the CVS or the Walgreens or the Osco Pharmacy. You don't need to designate one of them and only be tied to that one pharmacy. Whereas in Illinois with the medical cannabis, you need to specifically pick which dispensary you're gonna go to. And then if you wanna change dispensaries, you're gonna have to pay the state of Illinois, Illinois a 25 dollar fee to change uh, that dispensary. Uh, part of the reasoning for that fee is that your medical cannabis card in Illinois will have your designated dispensary on it and if they're going to have to issue you a new card they want $25 from you. Um, all this is going to do is deter patients from switching dispensaries and really being able to shop around for the best prices or the best products that have the most impact for giving them relief. One of the reasons that the state of Illinois put that in the rules and the law is that because patients are allowed to purchase a very uh, specific amount of medicine in a given period of time, they didn't want to see patients going from dispensary to dispensary buying the maximum amount of medicine and, and violating that cap on the amount of medicine, even though all the medicine being purchased is going to be tracked in real time through a seed to sale tracking software that the state of Illinois uh, has, has put together. And the local zoning, um, this has to do with the uh, ability for towns to not allow for a medical cannabis in, uh, dispensary in their municipality. Uh, essentially, they can't de deny them outright, but what they can do is make it a big headache when it comes to the local zoning, requiring them to get a special use permit and then making them jump through all sorts of hoops to get that special use permit. So with these dispensaries, again, there's 60 distributed geographically. They had to be 1,000 feet from a school, a daycare center. They can't be in a house or an apartment, obviously, and then they need to have 24-hour security. And this is a little bit of a breakdown of where those dispensaries are located. Um, so for that outside Chicago, that's one for each state police district in those state police district numbers. And then uh, you see the, the breakdown for uh, so three for DuPage, Lake County, and Will. Um, I, ideally, you'd have one in each of those counties, uh, but that's not the way that the actual uh, licenses were awarded, unfortunately. And then again, this is review. They can only purchase from the cultivation centers in Illinois. Um, and then this was part of the law that was eventually corrected, was that the patients um, could not be an owner of the, the dispensaries. Again, we had to... Uh, designate one dispensary per patient. They're not gonna allow consumption on site uh, and they can't share office space with a physician or refer patients to a specific physician. That's become a big hurdle in the state of Illinois because the physicians don't really see any financial reasons why they should be writing these recommendations because they don't have any real financial skin in the game, which is significantly different than the California model. And then these are the limits for what patients can possess or buy. <coughs> It's two and a half ounces to a single patient in a two week period, unless the patient has a waiver from the Department of Public Health. So if the doctor feels that you need more than that two and a half ounces every two weeks, um, they can write you that waiver and if DPH approves it, the patient will be allowed to purchase more. Now, a lot of people look at that two and a half ounces per two weeks and they go, wow, you know, that's a lot of cannabis, Dan. That's five ounces per month. Do you really think patients are gonna go through five ounces of medical cannabis per month? And in some regards, probably not, uh, especially if they're purchasing five ounces of flour, which are the buds of cannabis, and then just smoking them or consuming them that way. But if the patient is buying uh, ounces of medical cannabis and then turning them into their own edibles, uh, they can go through that real quickly. If they use one ounce of cannabis to make a batch of brownies that they get eight brownies of, and then they eat two brownies a day, they'll be able to go through that limit really quickly. Uh, it also is determined on the actual amount of cannabis that goes into the edibles. So if the cultivation centers are producing medical cannabis brownies and they use one ounce of cannabis to produce eight brownies, each of those brownies will have one eighth of an ounce of cannabis in it. And that one brownie that is purchased by the patient, then uh, that eighth of an ounce would go towards that two and a half ounce limit per two weeks. Uh, it also comes into play then with the uh, infused products like tinctures or oils or waxes or dabs that people might be familiar with. Uh, those type of concentrates have a lot more than two and a half ounces in them, but it would all determine on how much of that medical cannabis went into producing those concentrates like hashish or dabs or hash oil. And they can only sell to the patients. The dispensaries cannot produce the edibles, tinctures, or salves. 
Another thing that the two and a half ounces um, could be easily overcome with, uh, and this is something that's starting to gain a lot of popularity, is the actual juicing of the raw cannabis leaves. Uh, there's a YouTube video out there by a, a Dr. Lindsay, um, I think it's Dr. Lindsay, in California whose wife has lupus, and her wife, his wife was told that she'd never be able to have kids. They started juicing the raw cannabis leaves, kind of like if you've ever been to a gym and you get like a wheatgrass shot, you know, it's just like a, a little one ounce shot of the, the raw wheatgrass that they juice in front of you. Um, the, the medical cannabis in Illinois, the people that are looking to do that raw juicing, it'll be extremely difficult for them to do that because the dispensaries probably aren't gonna have those raw leaves available. And if they are, that two and a half ounces could easily be uh, consumed real quickly if they're doing those one ounce uh, cannabis leaf, raw leaf shots, like you see the wheatgrass shots because those shots are usually a one ounce shot that you see people at the health clubs or gyms consuming. But when it comes to the raw leaves, at least with Dr. Lindsay's wife, she was doing a one ounce shot three times a day and it was taking about three dozen to four dozen raw leaves being juiced for her to get that one ounce shot and that's where you could see a patient easily overcoming that two and a half two and a half ounce limit per two weeks or 14 days so the fees for being a dispensary were not as uh, significant or uh, high up there as they were for the cultivation centers, but they were still burdensome for a lot of people that wanted to get involved in the medical cannabis industry. Uh, specifically, the liquid asset requirements, $400,000. A lot of people didn't understand why they would make that so high, especially given that the requirements for the cultivation centers were only $500,000. Uh, but one of the requirements of the law is that if they give you a medical cannabis dispensary license, you need to be able to keep the product on the shelves in an uninterrupted fashion and because the state of Illinois isn't going to do any type of price fixing or price checking on the program, uh, the cultivation centers can charge the dispensaries whatever they want. The dispensaries have to buy the medicine at that price to keep their license. And then if they want to sell to the patients at a loss or for at cost, they're going to need to do that. And you're going to need to have a lot of money to be able to do that. And that's why they were requiring $400,000 in liquid assets to give you a dispensary license. And even then, just because you have that money doesn't mean that they gave you the license because the licensing and application process was extremely competitive. We already went over some of this. Patients can't be felons. They have to undergo fingerprinting and background checks. The ratio of patients to caregivers is a one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, this is important because in a lot of other states, the ratio is not one-to-one. -one. You'll see a caregiver be able to take care of, say, five patients, especially in states that allow caregivers to grow for the patients. Um, and it also allows them for caregivers to be able to pick up uh, large amounts of medicine at the dispensary and then deliver it to the patients. Uh, the state of Illinois did not want to see any type of delivery services like that. And then they, they made the, the ratio a one-to-one -one so that if you are a patient, you can only designate one caregiver to have the access to buying your medicine for you and then bringing it to you for you. And uh, hopefully it goes without saying the caregivers are not allowed to consume the medicine and caregivers cannot be patients either because both of those would then violate that two and a half ounce limit for the patients. Um, per 14 days. Again, there's an annual fee for participation. For patients, it's 50, or for patients, it's $100. For veterans or low-income patients, it's $50. For the caregivers, I believe it's 25. And then there's a notation on the driver's license of patients so that the law enforcement can know that if they make a traffic stop that you are a medical cannabis patient. <coughs> the sunset date is December 31st, 2017. Uh, this House Bill 3299 extends the medical cannabis pilot program to four years from the first dispensary opening. Uh, that House Bill 3299 has passed both the Illinois House as well as the Illinois Senate and is awaiting approval from Governor Rahner. Um, I was discussing this a little bit before class with Bruce Sewick. I don't think that the governor is going to be real quick to sign this into law given how much the sponsor of the legislation is actively in the press calling out the governor for other political reasons. So when it comes to medical cannabis, there's a number of different ways of consuming. Obviously, smoking is the most popular and well-known. There's also vaporizing or the vape pens that you see becoming more and more popular these days. Uh, edibles, a lot of people are familiar with those. 
oils and tinctures. And for people that don't know, the tinctures are the bottles like this where you'll take the medicine, and they do this for a lot of other substances too, and they'll soak them in either a, a vegetable glycerin or an alcohol compound, and then remove all the plant material after they've been soaking for any period of time from one month to three months. And by removing the plant material and using the alcohol solvent or the uh, vegetable glycerin, it'll extract the actual cannabinoids from the medicine, and you won't have the plant material, and you just take like an eyedropper or squirt of the medicine. They do this for a lot of other herbal, uh, therapeutically active substances like valerian root, echinacea, St. John's wort. So when it comes to the medical research on cannabinoids, cannabinoids are the compounds found in the cannabis plant. Anyone familiar with the word cannabinoid? Hey, that's not bad. That's really good, actually. Uh, so far, there are over 70 known cannabinoids that interact with the endocannabinoid system. Uh, if you're going into medicine or you're a, a fan of medical studies, the endocannabinoid system is something that really is cutting edge. We're just starting to learn a lot about it. Uh, it's found in all mammals. Uh, the human body, even if you don't consume cannabis, can produce endocannabinoids. Uh, a lot of people are starting to attribute the runner's high, if you're familiar with that concept, to some of the endocannabinoids that the human body body will produce even without consuming cannabis uh, or herbal cannabis that should be and uh, the, the way that the cannabinoids interact in the human body is through the CB1 and CB2 receptors uh, there's a lot of heavy science if you start looking into this stuff uh, and for what it's worth there was not one but two international cannabinoid research society symposiums held in Illinois not far from here uh, up in St. Charles at Pheasant Run Resort long before we ever had a medical cannabis law in Illinois. Uh, 2009 and 2011, the International Cannabinoid Research Society held their symposiums here. Uh, and this was not your typical hippie medical cannabis advocates conference. This was a lot of doctors, academics, researchers, pharmaceutical R&D developers, uh, looking at the different synthesized standardized cannabinoids and how they interact with these CB1 and CB2 receptors. Um, and that, conference, those symposiums, they were sponsored by people like GW Pharmaceuticals, Abbott Labs, the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse Awareness, and a whole slew of other pharmaceutical and government agencies. So uh, sometimes when I do talks, I have a specific bullet point that I say, you know, big pharma, do they love or hate medical cannabis? Uh, because a lot of people will tell me the only reason medical cannabis hasn't been legalized in all the states is that big pharma doesn't want to see the competition. Well, in some ways, yes, and in some ways, no, because Big Pharma is used to that standardized, synthesized model and paradigm of medicine, whereas most medical cannabis thus far has been under the paradigm of this is an herbal product that can be grown by a lot of people, and you're going to cut out the, the pharmaceutical industry in that way. Nevertheless, as this industry matures, as this medicine starts to become more tolerated and approved in this country and internationally, you'll start to see these specific cannabinoids in specific cannabinoid combinations synthesized, standardized, and put into pill forms like you do with other medicines. So some of the common cannabinoids that people are uh, talking about these days, if you are going to start looking at this research, THC is by far the one that most people have heard of. It's the one that has the most psychoactive properties. And for decades of the illicit cannabis industry and cultivation, looking to maximize THC because that's what the industry really was looking to maximize and produce because that's what the consumer demand was. People like to get high. People like to get stoned. The THC is what does that. So they were always looking to produce as much THC THC as possible. Uh, that's where you started to see the development of syncymia, or cannabis that does not have seeds in it. Uh, that's where they were taking away the male cannabis plants and only allowing the female cannabis plants to maximize flower production and the THC trichromes which are the little crystals on the actual flowers. If the cannabis plant gets uh, pollinated those flowers will switch the energy to seed production instead of the THC trichrome production. Uh, so that's why a lot of the indoor underground horticulture was specifically aimed at eliminating the, the male pl cannabis plants and producing the biggest cannabis flowers with the maximum amount of trichromes. However, with the Dr. Sanjay Gupta special, and specifically with those symposiums that I mentioned, CBD is by far the uh, new kid on the block that seems to have the most potential for the medical benefits. One, because it has that 
uh, long sought after medical and therapeutic benefits without the higher psychoactive properties. So now you're starting to see all sorts of uh, products out there that contain CBD. And I can tell you honestly, a lot of them are nothing more than snake oil salesmen. Uh, if you go on to Amazon, you can find high CBD oil that you can <laughs> legally buy in the state of Illinois and have it shipped to you. But if you were to actually put that oil under a lab test, uh, gas chromatography and examine it, it would have a minimal amount of CBD. Uh, a lot of the stuff is being produced in China. It has a lot of contaminants in it. And it's just somebody putting a sticker that says cannabidiol, high CBD oil, and a little syringe. And then they're charging you two or $300 on Amazon to get it. But at least with the San, Dr. Sanjay Gupta special, uh, what they were doing is producing a strain of cannabis, and the strains are just like there are different varieties of apples or grapes or types of wine or tomatoes. Um, and the high CBD strains are something that a lot more growers in other states are starting to produce because they want to see the maximization now of CBD and not THC. And the, the relationship between THC and CBD is an inverse relationship. So the higher the THC content, the lower the CBD, and therefore the higher the CBD content, the lower the THC. Um, but if anybody was a investor here or wanted to put uh, a certain amount of value on you know, 20 years from now, what cannabinoid are most people gonna be looking for and, and going after, it would be the CBD at least when it comes to the medical and therapeutic benefits. Uh, the other one, CBN. Uh, CBN is being attributed a lot more towards sleep disorders. Uh, so anybody with insomnia that would be looking to buy a medical variety of cannabis, they would be looking for a cannabinoid profile that has a high CBN strain. Anandamide, that's the one that a lot of people attribute the runner's high to. And then the, uh, the 2-AG and both anandamide, those are endocannabinoids that the body can produce on its own without the herbal canna cannabis being consumed. Okay, so now we're getting into some studies. And this one really upsets a lot of people. Uh, just about everybody knows somebody uh, that has suffered from cancer or died from cancer. Uh, and all this study says is that there was research uh, that cannabinoids can slow the growth of cancer and, uh, and tumors. Uh, the biggest thing to take away from this is the date, uh, 1974. Um, that was before I was born. Uh, for a long time, people have known that cannabinoids have the potential to treat cancer. And every now and then on the news, they'll talk about a new cancer treatment being developed. Uh, yet there really is a minimal amount of press coverage or mainstream media coverage about the anti-cancer properties of ca cannabis and cannabinoids. Uh, yet this study from the Medical College of Virginia came up with this finding in laboratory mice as far back as 1974. Uh, if you're looking for more uh, scholarly journals, this is where that study was actually published in the uh, Journal of National Cancer Institute. Um, and if anybody wants this type of data, you can email me or the, uh, the presentation will be online so you can get these sources and citations. Uh, here's another quote from uh, a journal that is peer reviewed. Uh, possess anti-cancer activity. I mean, all you need to do is come up with any other drug and that would be on the evening news tonight. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that this is providing anti-cancer properties in human beings. Uh, a lot of this is done in Petri dishes along with lab rats. Uh, nevertheless, it does have that promise of treating cancer. And obviously, both the research towards finding a cure for cancer, as well as the treatment of cancer, as well as the treatment of the side effects of treatment of cancer are all huge industries in this country. Uh, and one could make the opinion that there's actually more money to be made in not finding a cure for cancer than there is in finding a cure for cancer. But I don't want to get into those type of discussions just yet. So if you're looking for medical cannabis or medical organizations that have endorsed cannabis in some form or another, um, there's a whole list of them. This is just the ones that begin with the word American for what it's worth. Uh, so you can find a whole list of other organizations. Um, one of the interesting ones is the one on the bottom, American Society for Addiction Medicine. Uh, a lot of people talk about, especially opponents of medical cannabis or legalizing cannabis. Uh, you know, if we were to legalize this or you know, the state of Colorado or even in Illinois now, we're seeing increased numbers of people admitted to treatment for cannabis. Uh, the problem with those stats, as we'll get into, is that a lot of those aren't voluntary admissions. Uh, and then if you do look at the actual data in states that have legalized medical cannabis, the rate of 
overdose deaths from pharmaceutical drugs has actually dropped significantly. Um, so significantly that it's, I believe, a 25 or 27 uh, percent reduction in overdose, overdose deaths. And the CDC has reported for the past couple of years uh, that more people are dying from pharmaceutical overdoses than all illegal drugs combined. Uh, a lot of people don't talk about that, but that statistic alone is something that people should definitely keep in mind next time they go to their doctor and their doctor is prescribing them a pill to treat the side effects of another pill that the doctor is already prescribing them. So here's the American Medical Association, uh, by far the medical association that most doctors refer to. Uh, and really this is just saying that the scheduling as a Schedule One substance needs to be reviewed. There have been a few federal courts in California that have had cases brought to them looking to review the scheduling, uh, but obviously nothing has been done yet. And for what it's worth, we kind of get into these finger pointing of the bureaucracies of who's able to uh, actually reschedule cannabis on the federal level. The FDA says Congress needs to do it. Congress says the FDA needs to do it. Other people feel that because the FDA is part of the executive branch, that the president could do it. Um, in my opinion, any of them could do it if they really wanted to do it. We just don't have that political will to see it happen yet. So back to the Illinois program. This is the, uh, the first 10 of the list of qualifying conditions. Most of these are people are pretty familiar with cancer, glaucoma, AIDS, hepatitis C, ALS, Crohn's disease, Alzheimer's, wastings, mu muscular dystrophy. And then we're going to start to get into some diseases that people probably aren't so familiar with. Uh, syringeal myelio, uh, Tarlov cysts, spinal cord injury. Uh, for what it's worth, I was a personal assistant to a good friend of mine who was a spinal cord injury patient who has a C6, C7 spinal cord injury. He's a quadriplegic. He can't use his hands. Uh, for three and a half years, I helped him with his day-to-day -day functioning. Uh, at one time, I was actually arrested for medical cannabis that I had purchased for him. Uh, that's a whole other story that gets into my dark and deep past. Uh, but let's just say I'm quite familiar with the legality of medical cannabis in Illinois before it was actually legal. <laughs> Uh, traumatic brain injury is a big one uh, because TBI is something that you're seeing a lot more veterans coming home with uh, along with PTSD. Multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, Tourette's, um, the RSD and CRPS. Uh, as of the first 40 conditions that were approved in Illinois, these two were the closest ones to just any type of pain that we could get involved in the program. Chronic pain was not included in the original law. It still has not been included. Uh, the Medical Cannabis Advisory Board approved 11 new conditions. Two of them deal with pain, but none of them are just a broad category of chronic pain. Uh, the ones that the Medical Cannabis Advisory Board approved are post-operative pain, so after you have a surgery, uh, as well as diabetic, uh, diabetic neuropathic pain. So if you have diabetes, the nerve pain that's associated with it uh, is one of those conditions that could be approved as soon as the director signs off on it. Um, but chronic pain is not a condition at this point. And in states like Colorado, where you have about 108, 110,000 patients that have been approved to use medical cannabis in Colorado, uh, about 85% of those recommendations in Colorado are for chronic pain. And if you look at the increased problems with opioids and painkillers, both in Chicago, the suburbs, across the country, a lot of those are doctors and pain management clinics just trying to provide some relief for their patients. And then one of the doctors that we had testify in Springfield actually was a pain management doctor who had a patient overdose and die on the pain medications that she had prescribed him because he was having a severe bout with pain one night and insta instead of taking the recommended two Vicodins, he took four Vicodins and simply never woke up. And after that happened to that doctor's patient, she started learning more about medical cannabis, she started learning more about the safety of medical cannabis, and that's what motivated her to uh, start helping the, the, the legislative efforts in Illinois. So back to the Illinois law, who cannot be a medical cannabis patient? Law enforcement officers and firefighters. Uh, this is actually a pretty big group, and this is one of those groups that we would like to see added to this law because uh, it's essentially if you can co-op the enemy into joining your team, you're going to have less of an enemy. And we know that there are a lot of law enforcement officers and firefighters who either suffer from chronic pain or have some form of PTSD as a result of their job duties. Uh, and that's where if we can get either of those conditions added, we know that we'll see a significant increase in the patient population from that top two categories. 
school bus drivers. Uh, uh, this was something that the po politicians and the media were going to have a field day with. If, uh, if you knew your kid's bus driver with that take, that's taken Johnny to school is a medical cannabis patient, it's going to be a nightmare. Uh, so that was one of the, the, the exclusions in terms of jobs, CDLs. And then again, anybody with those felony convictions of the Cannabis Control Act, Controlled Substances Act, Methamphetamine Control Act. So the dispensaries, two and a half ounces every 14 days. And again, that limit includes the weight of the cannabis used to make the infused product, not the actual weight of the brownie or the cookie or the tincture. And then they're not able to grow their own medicine. The caregiver's got to be 21. They can only support one patient and they must purchase the medicine from a dispensary. What to do moving forward, if you want to talk to your doctor about a recommendation, if you want to be a patient, that would be the first step. Uh, let the lawmakers know. I mean, that's a huge thing in Illinois is letting lawmakers know how you feel about this product and this program. Learning more about cannabinoids, the more that you can talk the language of the science of these compounds, the smarter you're going to sound, and the more you'll be able to educate people. And again, educate others about the program and the medicine, medical cannabis organizations, Americans for Safe Access, the International Cannabinoid Research Society. That's the one that held the two symposiums at Pheasant Run Resort in St. Charles. Um, they do one symposium in Europe and then one symposium in North America. And for whatever reason, they did back-to-back -back symposiums in the Chicagoland area, despite us not having a, um, a medical cannabis program at the time. The official website for the medical cannabis pilot program, mcpp.illinois.gov. Uh, I probably tell that to somebody on the phone two or three times a day. A patient calls, they want to get more information, they want to figure out how to apply. That is the official website that the state of Illinois has put together for this program. Um, the problem, though, is that, you know, in some of these phone calls I get, they're from senior citizens that don't know how to use the Internet. Uh, so you can't exactly tell Granny, go to this website, print up the application, and mail it in, uh, because Granny doesn't know how to use the Internet. She's not going to have her grandson do this for you. Uh, so sometimes what I end up doing is literally printing off those applications, mailing it to these senior citizens, along with that 10 tips spreadsheet, uh, so that they can begin this process. So when we're talking about cannabis, if it's a, a safe or dangerous substance, and these are slides from a, a talk I did at the University of Illinois that was uh, a panel about marijuana monsters and milk was the title of it. And it dealt with public health and public safety myths and realities about marijuana, cannabis is the scientific term, monster energy drinks, and raw milk. And it was interesting because I got up there and, and did my spiel about the safety of medical cannabis, you know, no documented overdoses in the entire history of human use of, of cannabis, uh, this lethal dose 50 rating. Uh, and then the, the other people in that panel got up there and talked about raw milk and how it's really not safe and uh, there's still this growing consumer demand for it. And then another person got up there and talked about the monster energy drinks and actually had a couple of citations of young adults who were teenagers um, in both instances who had some type of heart defect that was unknown to them at the time. And the one young adult, uh, she was, I think, 17. She consumed a Monster Energy drink the night before. She got up and consumed another one before school the next day. And the level of caffeine in those drinks triggered some type of uh, cardiac arrest in her, and she subsequently died. Um, and with those Monster Energy drinks or the five-hour energy drinks, there's no age restriction. There's no limit purchase restrictions. Yet the public health and uh, uh, the public safety around them is somewhat dangerous, yet people don't know about it, people don't talk about it. And if you start to look at the aisles in a convenience store or a gas station, you're starting to see more and more of these upper-level caffeine drinks out there for people. Even at some of the coffee islands at the gas station, they have the little shots of extra caffeine that you could put in your coffee. So back to cannabis, you have this LD rating, which is at what rate does 50% of the population that consumes that amount actually die from it. And with cannabis, uh, they just aren't sure what that LD50 rating is. Uh, they think it's something of one, which is the standard dose, you would have to consume 20,000 times that standard dose, or somewhere around 40,000 times that standard dose. Uh, and what that really equates to in cannabis consumption is if that one is a joint, you would need to consume about 20,000 joints in about a 15 minute period. Um, now, as many people have probably tried to do that, as many uh, you know, old hippies or Cheech and Chong wannabes out there have tried that, uh, it just hasn't happened yet. Uh, when it comes to documented 
cannabis fatalities. There was one in South America last year where a smuggler got into a car accident and all the cannabis that they were smuggling fell on them as a result of the car accident and crushed them. That is the closest we've gotten to a cannabis overdose fatality. Uh, so sometimes my, one of my colleagues will say, the amount of cannabis it would take to kill you is the amount of cannabis it would take to physically crush you um, because of that one instance of a South American smuggler. Uh, and again, that LD rating of 1 to 20,000 or 40,000, if you look at other substances, Tylenol, alcohol, um, a lot of over-the-counter medicines, it's usually somewhere in the 1 to 8 to 1 to 25 ratio. Uh, which is if you are supposed to take two Advil as a standard dose, if you were to take 15 times that, which would be 30 Advil, there's a good chance that you will die. And that's where that 50% of the population that takes 30 Advil is about the number that about half of them would die. So if you, if, I mean, if you really want to look at how safe or dangerous a substance is, that LD50 rating is, is one of the mechanisms that the, uh, the medical and scientific community look at for the safety or efficacy of a substance. Here's an Institute of Medicine 1999 uh, quote about their, uh, the gateway theory of medical cannabis. Uh, it doesn't really have any type of causal link to subsequent use of other illicit drugs. Uh, the one credit I will give to the gateway theory is that, especially with young people in high school, if they go through a health class like mine that says all illegal drugs are bad, and then they go to their local pot dealer, who's probably just one of their peers in high school, they buy a little pot, they smoke a little pot, they realize it's not that bad, all of a sudden they have lost all faith and warning about those other substances that they were told not to consume, whether it's cocaine, whether it's heroin, or any of these other pills that might be out there, uh, which actually do have a good chance that they will become addicted or a potential for an overdose fatality. And then here's some more information about um, treatment admissions for cannabis. <clears throat> so out of all these admissions, you get about 18% of them. And then out of that 18%, about half of them are referred there by the criminal justice system. So this isn't a lot of people who are coming to the conclusion that I have a problem consuming too much cannabis, I need to go get treatment. These are people who get caught with cannabis, they go to court and the judge says, well you can either go to jail for 30 days or you can go to treatment. And most sane people will go into treatment instead of jail. The problem is, is that that pads the statistics for treatment uh, and then the drug treatment industry, the anti-drug crowd, the law enforcement community will then cite these statistics for how many admissions there are for treatment in a state like Colorado or in other states like Illinois even uh, when it comes to should we legalize cannabis, should we lower the penalties for cannabis laws. Even to this day we still feel uh, that type of opposition in Springfield when it comes to loosening our laws on cannabis are these statistics for who's actually getting treatment for cannabis. Questions? Acknowledgements? Professor Bruce Seawick, Illinois Normal, College of DuPage, the Illinois General Assembly.